And with that, I'm really excited that we have two researchers here to talk about a changing tide in metrics. So, uh, Sosha and Robin, the floor is yours. I'll be sitting with you and feel any questions. So, to start. Thank you. M uh, morning, sort of, everyone. Um, okay, so. Uh, uh, we're doing a, the structure of this talk will be a little bit like the, the previous one in that um, I'll be doing a sort of introductory session uh, telling you the sort of the who and the why of uh, uh, who we're here, why we're here and uh, what we're going to be talking about and then I will hand over to Robin to uh, take you into the detail of um, the, the investigation that we've been doing into this, this changing tide in metrics. Okay. Uh, and I guess the first thing to mention is that Robin and I are here in our capacity as co-chairs of the Lisp Bibliometrics uh, Committee. Um, so your first question may well be, what is Lisp Bibliometrics? Um, so a little bit of detail on that. Um, at heart, we are a research metrics community of interest. Um, we were founded in 2010 by Jenny LaSalle and Lizzie Gadd. Um, and the idea was uh, to provide a forum for discussion for primarily librarians who were working with bibliometrics often for the first time in ways that were new to their roles, um, to uh, yeah, provide a forum for them to share best practice, ask questions, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and since then, we've really uh, broadened out both in the scope of our membership. So we now have both as uh, bibliometric practitioners and librarians, but we also have researchers, research managers, uh, metrics providers, uh, publishers, all sorts of people in our membership. Um, and we've also broadened out from just the kind of UK higher education context to uh, we've got members uh, across the world. Although, obviously, given the nature of, of the list, it's uh, all English speaking. So, yeah, uh, we do acknowledge a bias there. Um, but yeah, we're open to anybody who would like to join. Um, uh, uh, basically, if you have an interest in, in research metrics, or particularly citation metrics, um, you know, we are your people. Um, and as I said, as well as the broadening of our membership, we've also broadened the scope of our activities. So whilst the discussion forum, uh, the mailing list is still kind of the heart of our activities, we also have a current issues blog where we uh, discuss things like um, the uh, sort of metrics, again, in a broad range of contexts. So everything from responsible use, um, for example, in the context of informing redundancy decisions and things like that, to the use of citation data in things like um, uh, citation recommendation tools or um, uh, you know, uh, what to do about hyper-authored papers and how that impacts um, the citation data. So yeah, wide range of things. Um, we also have an annual conference, um, not quite on the scale of this one. Um, uh, last year, the last two years were um, uh, online. We're hoping to move to uh, back to a physical or uh, possibly a hybrid um, event this year. So I am taking notes for how you're making this work so smoothly. Um, uh, just to give you a flavour of the sorts of things we talk about, um, uh, last year's theme was measuring what matters, um, where we were investigating and exploring way, different ways to uh, look at research evaluation, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Um, and the year before that, our focus was uh, new tools and technologies, so again, looking at kind of new ways to conduct citation analyses, um, and also new uses for those analyses. So, for example, in the context of information discovery, rather than, and rather than in research evaluation. Um, as well as that, we have a metrics competencies framework, which I think is a really valuable piece of work. The idea for this was um, to develop some core competencies for the field. Um, so this is broken down into four kind of er four main areas. Um, we have uh, technical skills that would be expected of practitioners, um, uh, field specific knowledge, uh, these sorts of roles and responsibilities that um, tasks and responsibilities that uh, practitioners should be expected to do. Um, and then what I think is really important, uh, professional integrity markers. So the, the key things uh, that practitioners should be responsible for in terms of um, uh, making sure that the, they uh, support responsible use of the metrics that they're providing. Um, and then uh, we also have a range of training and education resources. So for example, things like responsible metrics guides for specific uh, metric suppliers, so insights, um, uh, Saival, um, we also will hopefully have more coming out. So, uh, and then actually one thing that isn't on this slide, um, but the kind of thing that keeps all this stuff going is our uh, is the Lisbon Bibliometrics Committee. So a group of uh, really kind of vibrant and engaged people um, that work with us to, to yeah make all this happen. Um, so yeah, just kind of a, a 
just to reiterate, if any of this is sparking joy, um, please do get involved, comment on the blog, uh, join our mailing list, um, you know, come and talk to us on Twitter if you are still on there. Um, uh, you know, we, are, we are here, we are you know, we're happy to talk about anything to do with metrics, so yeah, come, and, come and join us. Okay, so that's who we are. Um, so I'm going to pull back now and give a little bit of context for why we're here today and what we want to talk to you about. So the kind of timeline for uh, the changes in the uh, responsible metrics landscape. So in 2010, as I mentioned, the list building metrics uh, discussion group was formed. And the reason I kind of flagged that up is because this is just kind of one example of the f how uh, conversations were bubbling up in higher education about how we were using metrics, were we doing it in a sensible way, um, you know, what were we doing and how and why, um, and you know, sharing best practice, and you know, these questions were being asked. Um, and in 2010, then we had DORA, the San Francisco uh, Declaration on Research Assessment, um, which was a set of principles that institutions and individuals could sign up to to show that they were supporting uh, the responsible use of metrics. In 2015, we have the Leiden Manifesto, um, again, another way to, to show that you, you're supporting a, a, a responsible way to use metrics in research evaluation. And also in the same year, we have the Metric Tide, um, which was a set of recommendations for how metrics should be used in the context of UK uh, research evaluation, so the REF in, in particular. In 2019, uh, Coalition S uh, adopted their responsible research metrics policy, and that was integrated into Plan S and, theft, and then into the um, funder mandates for member organisations. So uh, anyone accepting funding from these organisations had to show how they were uh, committed to responsible metrics principles, how they were implementing those and monitoring them and so on. And then in 2022, just last year, we had the Metric Tide Revisited, which looked back at the Metric Tide recommendations and how they were actually implemented in the REF um, and what we should do going forward. Um, so these are just kind of a few of the key kind of moments in, uh, of change in the research metrics landscape. Um, and you can see that there's kind of a lot of, a lot of things happening, a lot of position statements being published. Um, and what we wanted to do was to kind of see how this was actually impacting researchers and research organisations. How has what they, what they do with research metrics changed um, in the light of these sorts of uh, publications? So, um, the, thus I give you the Responsible Metrics State of the Art Survey. Um, it's been an annual survey that we've run since 2015. Initially it was very small scale, um, so just went out to our mailing list and to uh, one other relevant uh, special interest group mailing list. And it was really just asking about DORA signups. So who'd signed up, why, um, and if not, why not? Um, since then, it's kind of year on year, it's kind of broadened out, um, both in terms of who, uh, is, who it's sent to, and also in terms of the questions we ask. So we now, for example, we now ask about um, whether institutions are developing their own bespoke um, metrics policies. Um, if so, who's involved in developing those? Um, what uh, other policies and principles are informing the development of those internal policies, um, what the kind of impact of policy has been, and what the academic reception is, um, uh, how policies are being uh, monitored for compliance, um, and also what sorts of tools that people are using for uh, conducting um, metric analyses, and also where they're, where they're getting the data from, what data sources are they using. Um, so a kind of wide range of things we're asking about, and uh, because we have this year-on-year -year data, um, we think it gives a really interesting kind of bit of insight into the way that the changes of these sorts of um, documents like DORA and Leiden Manifesto and so on, uh, the, the, the impact of those changes on the research metrics landscape on individual organisations. You can kind of get see how these things have penetrated into higher education and how things have changed. Um, I will say that it is not, uh, it's, a, it's a relatively informal survey um, and the sort of specific questions have changed from year to year so it's not uh, anything on the sort of scale and rigour of something like the Spring and Nature um, State of Open Data Survey um, but I think it does give a really interesting bit of insight as I said into what is going on um, and so with that I'm going to hand over to Robin to take you through the detail of what the survey says. Thank you. Thank you, Zosha. Um, what I want to show you first are some of the findings to the uh, 
a primary question on the survey that has been asked in each iteration of the survey between 2015 to 2021, which is to respondents, how has your institution uh, responded to DORA? What you can see with the, uh, the yellow category of other, this other is um, subcategories that I've aggregated to suggest that the institution's response to DORA is either that they hadn't heard of it, they weren't sure, or that they were not considering signing DORA. Um, and as you can see, um, where that figure has fluctuated um, between 2016 to 2021, uh, between 30 to 50%, that is um, perhaps after 2019, we would expect to see after that coalition S, which I think is a huge indicator to institutions that DORA was something that if they weren't already considering it, they needed to do so. We would expect to see that perhaps if this survey was continued into future years, that this um, might change. Where well, you can see the blue category of already signed or likely to sign DORA, that quite positive or rise of institutions suggesting already signed or likely to sign. Um, and then the orange category of um, actively considering and no decision made, uh, fluctuating between 10 to 20 percent of institutional responses. Um, and the uh, grey category of actively considered DORA and decided not to sign. So what might institutions be doing if they have considered DORA yet decided not to sign? They could be doing something else. You can sign DORA, a formal commitment as an individual or an organisation, and or um, develop your own set of responsible metric principles and with this question in the survey, we're able to see um, that this actually seems to be something that a lot of institutions are choosing to pursue. So with the blue category, created or developing their own set of principles, this has a really sharp increase from 2015 onwards, um, with actually in the, the last year of the survey, 2021, around 40% of respondents um, claiming that their institutions are doing that, developing their own principles. Um, and this, I think, Although we can't infer this based on our survey limitations only and the type of data that was collected, I think that the um, flexibility of something like the Leyden Manifesto, which is instead a set of principles which, in all, which you do not formally sign or not sign, um, it's rather a set of recommendations to take into your own practice, that actually point two of the Leiden Manifesto suggests that all research evaluation at an organisation should be um, in the matching the programme agenda or values or research agenda of the own institution. And I think that's a huge prompt for institutions to think as an alternative or in addition to signing DORA that you can actually pursue your own um, responsible metrics agenda for your local organisation. With the orange category of um, already considering your own principles but no decision made, I think that's quite similar to um, what we just saw on the previous slide of um, that organisations can often take a long time to reflect on some of these very complex questions. Any of you that work in um, research organisations will probably be very familiar with the amount of time that it can take to um, seek and gain agreement from different players within these large organizations. And then this uh, very small category of um, receiving not more than 5% of respondents, the gray category of actively considered own principles and decided against. Um, another, um, I've also indicated 2019 on here to also um, remember that the Coalition S um, position statement actually allows not just also to have signed DORA, but also encourages or expects their um, funding receiving organizations to have um, joined through another or to pursue your own bespoke responsible metric principles or to follow the Leiden Manifesto. So there is relative freedom here for institutions. So if you go about um, delivering your own bespoke responsible metric statement, what might you look to for um, inspiration or for a model? So I think it's really unsurprising that we see here um, very high 
levels of you know, fluctuation between 50 to almost 80% in some years of respondents considering the Leiden Manifesto to be an inspiration for their own uh, bespoke responsible metric statements. Um, what I also think is really interesting is the um, fluctuations of institutions looking to other universities' statements for inspiration. I think that speaks a lot to the willingness of research organizations or universities to look to one another for examples of best practice um, and perhaps a slight um, risk aversion in wanting to see what is working for other organizations in this area that's actually that's very new um, and that is a very complex set of kind of understandings of how your organization works to see what has worked for others I think is extremely um, compelling. Um, and then, of course, the uh, inspiration side of the metric tide would perhaps like to see that um, this survey has only gone up to 2021, but that perhaps in future years with the metric revisited, um, having been published in 22, that this might then um, have repositioned the metric tide's recommendations, which I really strongly recommend um, in the minds of those delivering their own responsible metrics agendas. So everything that will have been done at an organization in the pursuit of a responsible metrics principle is essentially done in the effort of trying to benefit academic staff and the research agenda. Looking um, at the responses to the question that we ask on how have academics received any responsible metrics uh, policies or statements, I think it's really not surprising that um, over 40% of respondents claim um, or perceive a mixed response from academics. I think for many of the reasons of some of the uh, nuances that we actually just discussed in the uh, prior presentation, the complexities of installing these values, yet recognizing that there are perceived or real hierarchies of journals and the pervasive journal reputations and qualities of branding. The um, very small response of negative uh, responses over under 5%. Um, and that I think what is very wise is perhaps is the small number of responses that actually would be characterized as well as actually too early to, um, to tell here that these changes will take time to have effect and time really, I think, especially in the size of some of the organizations that might be being discussed here, to actually become disseminated and for sort of long-term responses to be formed. So we also provided in the survey space for free text responses for the respondents to describe how they perceived um, feedback to responsible metric statements or agendas. And so what I'm showing you in these slides is in the italic quotation marks, responses that have come into our survey um, and underneath as indicated by the blue arrow is a kind of contextual information that I think is contextual information that is maybe what's come from our ideas of interpreting some of these um, feedbacks or positions and that kind of broader context of the sector. So this survey response picking up on that idea of that it's actually too early to tell how are these um, agendas working, it's this response of it's going to take a long time to change the culture and move away from journal impact factor. Um, absolutely, I am the statement here that's below from the uh, Wellcome Trusts, what do researchers think about the, work, the research culture they work in report that found that only 14% of researchers agree that current metrics have had a positive impact on research culture. And that's, a, that's really shocking. Everything that we do in our roles in bibliometrics, everything that those of you here who maybe provide um, metrics or um, analytics, the fact that everything that, that this entire metrics culture, only 14% of academics as per this, this report, the Welcome Report, actually think that that has a positive impact on academia and that I think is really indicative of how long-term these problems are and th these statements are only the beginning. And it could, it, I think this is a generation, if not 
even longer's work on improving this. So another comment from the survey, their responsible metrics policies have in affected institutional key performance indicators, appraisals, promotion process, recruitment, and information management. But this absolutely is what um, anybody setting out to ask their vice chancellor, their provost to sign DORA or to um, install a responsible metrics policy could hope for, that the policy has influence not just in the library or in the research office, but that the policy has been affected through HR and is being disseminated out into faculties and departments where these decisions that affect researchers' livelihoods um, are being made. Um, and then I wanted to show you this example below from a um, UK institution that in, uh, I believe in 2021 stated that uh, they indicated 47 members of academic staff who were identified as having their job at risk by co because of um, a combination of funding and citation-based metrics. This was an institution that had had for some time at that point a responsible metrics policy. And this have selected as a reminder that having a policy or a statement, making that formal commitment there can be a huge divergence between that and what's actually happening in practice um, within departments, but that then having these mechanisms in place can then help rectify the situations like the one at this example at UK University, and indeed I understand that it was through having the responsible metric statement as a framework and being able to engage in some of the, with some of those organisations like DORA and the Leyden Group that was able to rectify this situation. So another uh, response that was uh, put to us in our survey was that um, union feedback is negative. They argue that no metric should be used at all. Um, and that is a perspective that I certainly come across. So for those that believe that there is no place for quantitative metrics of any kind, um, versus those that do see a place for um, quantitative metrics to support qualitative peer review and expert-led peer review. A, I think, really important reminder of how, of the extent to which we need to not let a datification of higher education happen um, is the case uh, of a, a UK university of a professor's death linked to uh, a metrics, funding metrics um, pressures. And that, that is something that should be in all of our minds when we do think of um, the metrics that we develop and how they are used. Another response to um, a institution's responsible metrics policy was, and this is something that I anecdotally have come across often as well in my own institution, management and business school was the only faculty we received negative feedback from. They want to protect their target journals list. So for any of you not familiar with a target journals list, this is something that we see often in um, management, business, um, economics, law faculties, where the faculty's promotion process or hiring process will explicitly use a target journals list. Popular ones for some of these fields in the UK are the CABS journals list or the Financial Times journals list. This is something that whilst, so speaking anecdotally here, in an institution that has three science faculties, having had a relatively positive response to some of the really exciting responsible metrics work we've been doing, that a, the business school faculty still looks towards some of these um, field, really respected journals lists, and that is in direct opposition to our responsible metrics com commitment and perhaps an indication that where some of these responsible metrics movements have come out of science fields, they're not yet um, meeting the needs of some of these social science fields. The example here below, that 73% um, of articles were found in a study, 73% um, of the articles published um, in 2019 in the Financial Times Top 50 journal list, which is a 
a very respected and well-used journalist, uh, were found to have no link, either explicit or implicit, to sustainable development goals. So um, I'm not suggesting that sustainable development goals are the only metric that we should now be using, but as an indication that something that many departments or institutions, when we talk about these kind of alternative uh, demonstrations of impact and finding things that matter, that if the same department that is seeking to demonstrate its impact by something like sustainable development goals, at the same time of working under a responsible metrics policy is still using a target journals list, we have to really work to help academic staff understand the discrepancy between that um, and also I think understand the quite pressured positions or maybe um, conflicting interests of department groups, departmental committees where the same people who are the um, perhaps the editors of a journal and editors of, of your journals are also those deciding well, how do we run our promotions around this year which are we going to use a top journals list in which case which list do we use and which journals go in it and I think that's a real conflict that we haven't yet um, unraveled so for those of you interested in bibliographic tools and databases Another question to the survey respondents is which um, bibliographic databases do you use in your work? And I think it will not be of surprise to so actually, so here the um, values do not add to 100% because respondents were able to select as many or as few products as they use in their practice, but that some of the tools like we have saw in um, Laura's presentation that are popularly used, Scopus and Web of Science, Dimensions, um, are quite straightforward in, in the sense that you know these are clearly targeted as uh, bibliographic tools for this kind of work and then you see the um, position at 15 percent and just under 15 percent of the institutional repository or the CRIS being used the CRIS would be the current research information system so this is thinking this is kind of a repurposing of institutional tools our institutional information system or the uh, repository using reporting out of the back end of that to repurpose um, some of that data into informing our own insights and what I think is also quite interesting is this position um, although it's a very small percentage of respondents who um, declared having used it to our survey but the, uh, the presence of something like site which suggests perhaps the role that um, natural language processing um, or um, artificial intelligence tools might in the future have to develop bibliographic information and knowledge sources. And then we also asked respondents which analytic tools or programs do you use? Here again with popular tools including um, the big commercial vendors tools like SciVal um, and um, Insights. It's nice to see here as well, almost 15% of respondents um, using Altmetric um, and, then, and then also a percentage of respondents using PlumX, suggesting that moving increase towards alternative metrics and then the presence of things like Tableau, Power BI, SQL, Google BigQuery, which suggests that increasingly institutions are actually looking to develop their own reporting platforms and be less perhaps reliant on some of these large analytic, large commercial analytics programs um, and much like as uh, Laura suggested that where there exists um, reusable interoperable data sets from other sources institutions are increasingly upskilling their staff to be able to instead use those. So I just want to close with the idea um, and this quotation is actually came from the, one of the feedback survey respondents as well, that with a clearer understanding of the limitations of bibliometrics, we are paradoxically also interest, increasingly able to undertake much more mature work with bibliometrics. So uh, by this, I think the um, kind of questions that we've been talking about here today, so those questions of who is allowed in to research careers, who publishes in research careers, those that were discussed at the inclusion panel yesterday, or some of those questions of how do we use the data that we have to inform um, our understanding of open access values, 
to inform um, transformative agreements, etc., that those are applications that um, universities can increasingly apply bibliometric skills towards um, and perhaps have more interest in doing so. I would say anecdotally, at Imperial, it's been about, I probably uh, in over two years since somebody's asked me for a citation report. Um, and maybe they are getting that data from somewhere else, but the kind of questions that instead we've been working towards are much more interesting. They are related to this use, to this changing um, sector, to things like open science. How do we measure open science? How do we um, prepare for rights retention schemes? How do we um, apply data to our equality, diversity, and inclusion questions. And that, I think, is much more interesting. Um, and that research organizations are using bibliometrics for. Um, and I hope that those of you who are from uh, data vendors or from publishers here, I know many of you are already engaged in that. And the more that you can share that with us, particularly those that have increasingly products that cross the research life cycle, University is really interested to learn as much as we can about our own authors, and sometimes we're limited in what we can see. So I really hope that future, that continued engagement and sharing of data here um, is coming in the future. And the note I want to end on is that that's from the Metric Tide Revisited, which was a really simple um, maxim that was use data for good, and that I do think is an outcome of this responsible metrics movement and that increasingly organisations are trying to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have had a couple of questions online and I have a couple of questions. I had a question as well to you guys. Do you want to? I've just got one more. Okay, we've got slide. five more minutes. Okay. Yes, I'll be super quick. Um, Let me do the questions. Oh, I have. Sorry, can I get the slides back up? Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to quickly to um, close with acknowledging all the people whose work went into that survey. So the Lisbon Bibliometrics Committee and the uh, wider community, and also specifically Lizzie Gadd, who um, uh, kicked the survey off in 2015 and, and uh, led on it for many years afterwards. And also Nicholas Robinson Garcia, our former research liaison officer on the committee, who um, was heavily involved in previous years. Um, if you are interested in uh, digging more into the details of those surveys, um, there's a link up there where you can see the report. Um, and uh, if you are interested, if you're an institution that's interested in developing your own responsible metrics policies, um, again, on, on our blog we do have some uh, resources which may be useful to you, so collections of responsible metrics policies from other institutions. Um, and I guess uh, my alternative closing, <laughs> I do, obviously do endorse everything that Robin said, would basically be to, um, to kind of ask you, in, in light of what you've just seen, does this uh, ring true for you? Does this match your own experiences of um, uh, responsible metrics implementation. So yeah, I'll throw a question out to you before we start answering them. Uh, and um, also, do, are there other things that you'd like to see asked in future surveys? What's missing? Um, yeah, what other areas would you like to see explored? Um, and that really is it, and we'll hand over for questions. Thank you. Yeah, the questions which came up, and which are also my question, is one question we had from Christine Annemarie on the sample size, whether the sample size changed a lot in the period what you did. I wanted to ask you um, a question on how is the geographic coverage of the sample you did, how much does it extend, for instance, to Asia and to, and to, and to that part of the world. And the last question also related to that from Bernie Folan was, uh, to share some experience on um, uh, what arguments are coming up um, for metrics to continue using the impact factor. I think I hope I paraphrased that right, Bernie. Otherwise, tell me. Thank you. Um, so, in terms of the uh, numbers of survey, re survey respondents, um, that has fluctuated quite a lot. So, as I said, it started off very small. I think we had about 22 respondents in, the, in 2015, uh, and it's grown, uh, I think, topping out at... Um, uh, Around 200 yeah. in prior years and just over 200 in the 2020 edition. Yeah, but yes, there is fluctuation. So, as I said, it's uh, 
an informal kind of uh, taste test, uh, not a uh, uh, hugely rigorous scientific survey. Was it geographics? Uh, so again, it's uh, because of the nature of the survey and where we push it out to, it's uh, heavily biased towards English language speaking respondents, um, in fact only English language uh, speaking respondents, um, uh, and primarily in Europe and Northern America, but uh, we also have respondents from uh, Australasia, and I think some South American South American respondents as well. Yes, um, particularly in the I believe in the 2019 and the 2020 editions because of being quite active in South American bibliometrics community, a crossover between our two uh, list communities. Yeah. Great. And I have. Hang on. Can I? Um, of course, the last the next question related to that from. From Bernie, it was, uh, hang on, uh, before we have one more question from Australia, which I'm really keen to, keen to get to, was uh, what sort of arguments are coming up to retaining the existing uh, impact factor and uh, target uh, journalist metrics? What is the response? Do you have any examples of that? Examples of arguments what? for? Yes, okay, for retaining, exactly. Um, I think that there is, still a place for quantitative bibliometrics um, to be used in balance with expert peer review uh, for questions of scale and also for questions um, of some of the problems with expert peer review um, and the expert panel reviews. Thank you very much. And actually, Danny didn't have a question, but it was just great to say that we have got audiences in Australia and uh, in North America waking up at incredible hours of the day for the Research to Reader conference. Any more questions in the audience? Because we've got two minutes before coffee. So um, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand in the room or ask a question online. Yes, I have one. Um, a statement from... Um, uh, Robert Kiley, did you want to ask a question, Robert? If you do, step to the microphone, it's, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. So it was more um, a question around, so we, many of us want to sort of move away from journal impact factors and journal aims as a proxy, but we all know in the real world that we want shortcuts and the sort of the idea that panel, you know, review panels or hiring teams should read or the, or the papers is just not feasible and are more likely they wouldn't have the expertise to understand the, the research anyway. So we need some alternatives. So I could just say, what are the alternatives? But that's hard. So I was going to suggest an alternative and see if what you thought about that. So a lot of valuable information gets generated through peer review reports and particular new models like eLife's sort of assessment, uh, pro assessment review assessment uh, model where they summarize the, the strength of a paper, the weaknesses, and its sort of impact. And I just wonder whether, if we're serious about trying to use different metrics responsibly, whether or not using sort of peer review reports, which are written by peers and experts, whether that actually, though it's not a metric as such, whether that is a viable alternative to this sort of corrosive nature of, of numbers and impact factors. I welcome your thoughts. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I would agree. I think we need a uh, broad variety of ways to assess impact and acknowledge that there are lots of different meanings of impact. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's definitely one that should be explored further. Um, I mean, I think the uh, changing publication models, um, you know, moving to micro nano publishing uh, ideas, uh, you know, kind of octopus as a uh, as a type of platform for, for publishing research um, uh, throughout the research life, research life cycle. I think those sorts of things will hopefully uh, help to change the, the way that we think about research and the way that we think about the impact of research and help to move us away from this, this sort of very metrics-based uh, metrics uh, assessment, which, as Robin has pointed out, can be useful and definitely has its place, but you know, yet I think we need to be looking at the question of research evaluation much more broadly. Um, uh, and to add that I think the scale of research publishing today and how we grapple with numbers that are that big and processes that are that big, I think 
these innovative ideas I really want to see flourish and want to see be resourced by institutions, but there is huge variation in how institutions are able to resource um, these kinds of more innovative ideas, and I wish that was different and we didn't have to rely on, on citation metrics. And with that, thank you very much for the panel, and I made a small correction I have to make. It's not coffee. Uh, I judged my coffee and levels wrong because I'm still in a Berlin time zone, so um, anyway, I'm still an hour behind. It's workshops next. Thank you very much.